Hi, thank you for joining me, Emily, on Temple Not Made by Hands. Today's episode, Stirred by the Word. And our reading is going to come from Exodus 31, 1 through 11, and Exodus 35, 20 through 35. So I trust that you'll go ahead and read that along with me. But before we get started, I want to start and finish this episode with Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. It says, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as in the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. So that was from the New King James Version. My word, my word in there that I'm highlighting here is assembling and other translations may say fellowship. I don't think that is wrong, but when I think of fellowship, I just kind of think of hanging out and talking and I feel like assembling is a stronger word. It gives you the idea of an appointed place that you are coming into alongside other people. It, it is a place and sense of belonging having something to offer and recognizing what everybody else has to offer too. So we're not forsaking the assembling, the coming together, the getting into our positions that have been assigned to us by God so that we can walk in the power and authority that he has ordained for the church. Because I see that day approaching and I'm pretty sure you see it too. So we want to make sure that we're not forsaking the assembling of ourselves, but getting into position and linking arms with other believers in the days that we're living in now. You see, in Exodus 31, Moses is on the mountain with God, and he is getting the blueprint for the tabernacle. So remember, he has been on the mountain with God for quite a while now. He's getting a lot of information here. God is giving him the law, giving him the Ten Commandments, explaining how he wants the tabernacle to look, giving uh, instructions on how the feast should be celebrated. So he's on the mountain for a while, and in this portion of Scripture, in 31, 1 through 11, God is talking about not only the tabernacle, but he's calling people and he's calling them out by name to show up and to serve in his kingdom. So let me read that part to you. It says, see, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship to design artistic works in the working of gold, silver, and bronze, in the cutting of jewels for the setting of carving wood, and to work in all manner of workmanship. And I indeed, I have also appointed a Holiab from the tribe of Dan. And I have put wisdom in the hearts of all the gifted artisans that they may make all that I have commanded you. So that's the conversation that Moses is having with God. And did you notice how he called uh, Bezalel by name? He called him by name. And then he's telling this to Moses while Moses is in his secret place. But then he also spoke to Bezalel through the spirit of God. And so this is so interesting. You know, this is where God speaks to us. It's in that secret place with God, whether it's on the mountain or our prayer closet or that secret place with God, that we're communing with God, that we're taking a listening ear to hear what the spirit of the Lord is saying. You see, I think prayer is a whole lot more about listening than it is talking. And the best advice I ever, ever got is as much time as you spend talking to God, spend that that much time listening. Spend that much time listening. So in this conversation, God is giving Moses instructions and he's telling him things to come. And I believe that God does that so that we can confirm his work too within uh, one, one another. We can see the work of God in each other. So God spoke to Moses. God spoke to Belzalel and many others. 
And then it could be confirmed when they actually see each other. God is getting them on the same page. Nobody has to convince anybody of what the work of God is doing because God spoke to them and then he brought them together and then he confirmed it. And then I think it's so interesting that the very first person that we see filled with the Holy Spirit of God is Belzalil. Belzalil, the artisan worker. It was not Moses. It was not Aaron. It wasn't the priest or the Levites, but it was the craftsman. And I feel like this is so hard to believe until we remember that not only was Jesus a prophet, a teacher, evangelist, the only suitable sacrifice for sin, God, very God, and the Savior of the world, but he was also a carpenter. He was a carpenter. When God is establishing a church, I believe he starts at the grassroots level of our everyday lives, and he is asking us to make him a priority in the midst of it. I believe that this is the call of God on our lives right now. It's to build his church through individuals. He is calling us in our jobs, in our schools, our communities, in the marketplace to win souls for the kingdom of God, to build his church, the temple not made by hands. He's calling us to build. And then to do it, we need wisdom, understanding, knowledge, and skill that the Holy Spirit provides. Skilled workers, whatever skill that we have that makes us fruitful in the marketplace, he wants us to bring him there with us. The Spirit of God, as we read here, Look at how it was expressed in Exodus 31.3. We see the Spirit of God expressed through wisdom, understanding, knowledge, and all manner of workmanship. So remember, wisdom is the proper application of knowledge. You see, knowledge is the solution to something. Understanding is knowing how to put everything together to solve the problem. But then wisdom is the proper application, the proper timing of everything, not just knowing how something works, but even when we should do it. So for example, if our cell phone dies, we know that all the information is in it. And then understanding says if you plug it up, it will recharge. But wisdom will tell us don't plug it up if it's been sitting in a puddle of water. You see, when wisdom is the proper application of something. It's the when. It's the timing. It's the next step of the thing to do. So the Spirit of God was expressed in wisdom, understanding, knowledge, and all manner of workmanship. All manner of workmanship. Christ wants us to take him with us into the workplace, into the marketplace, into our schools, everywhere that we go. We are serving and building a temple not made by hands. So this was where Moses was getting the instructions. And then God was even throwing names out there of people that he had already started working with, people that are filled with the Spirit of God. And that really just amazes me. This is the first time in Scripture that we see somebody filled with the Spirit of God. And it was to do his work. It was to do his work. So now we're skipping ahead to Exodus 35, and this is when the people start showing up. This is when the people start showing up to build. And then if you look at verse 21, it tells you who showed up. Those that were stirred and whose spirit was willing. Everyone whose heart was stirred and their spirit was willing and then it also says both men and women. So if we think we can build a church without men, if we think we can build a church without women, we are deceiving ourselves and probably doing the devil's work. God is calling men and women to work in unity for the spirit and for the kingdom of God. 
Everyone whose heart is stirred and whose spirit is willing, both men and women showed up. And the people of God used the wisdom and the skill that was provided by the Spirit of God. And then 35 tells us, for the service of the sanctuary. God has gifted us for his good purpose, not our own desires, but for his will and his divine purpose. Where he is, there his servants will be also. They'll be there because they heard his voice and they followed it. Nobody had to convince them. They didn't have to provide any advertisement, but they were stirred by the word that they heard from God, and then they were ready to put it to work. You see, we are anointed to do God's work. That word anoint means selected as if by divine election. We have been selected by divine ele election. And then it also means a divine enablement. It's something that we cannot do on our own, but that we have to rely on God to do it. And he can do that work through us. You see, in the tabernacle, they would anoint all of the vessels within it. But now we are the vessels that God has chosen to use. We are anointed. And there's so many different anointings that he has gifted us with. He has given us an expression of who he is. And he wants us operating in that, but not to shut somebody else out, but alongside of. There are anointings that I see coming up, uh, the apostolic anointing, those that are not afraid to go into dark places. Does everybody have that? No, but some do, and God is raising that up. I see a prophetic anointing, and that is the hearing how scripture speaks to us today. And then we definitely use that word way too loosely. And we do need to test the spirits of where we're getting these visions. Are we getting them from um, God? Or are we getting them from other sources? So we test it how? Scripture. A prophetic word is being able to go into scripture and God lifts it up and shows us how it applies today. And I believe God is raising up a prophetic teaching right now that the church needs. Gifting of evangelism, gifting of teaching, expository teaching, singing, preaching, financial, writing, intercession, deliverance, creative art, administrative, leadership, revival, counseling, martyr. Nobody wants that gift. But he would be with you in the midst of it if that's what you're called for. Construction, that's what we see here. Construction workers that he's he's calling up and raising up. You see, it's time for the body of Christ to take up their gifts so that we can get into position. Isaiah 10, 27 says, The yoke will be destroyed by the anointing oil. I believe as we take up our anointing, that the yoke will be destroyed. You see, he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So do you pick up on the work in progress here? We're to be operating in our positions together for the equipping until there's full unity. Do we have full unity? Definitely not. So it's a continuing work that is still in demand for today. So until we're in unity of faith, until we all have knowledge of the Son of God, we don't all have that right now. So it's a continuing work that God is working out through us. We have not become that perfect man operating in the image we were created in. Not yet. So we still have work to do. God is calling us to a good work that is alongside one of another that will be fruitful as we find ourselves assembled. You see, he said it's for the equipping 
of the saints for the work of the ministry. That's why you have been gifted. That's what your gift is for. And then it's that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried away by every wind of doctrine, by trickery of men, and by cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But it is time for us to speak the truth in love and to grow up into all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share and it causes growth for the edifying of itself in love. You see, I think the problem is, is sometimes we might not know what our gifting is. So we're not able to operate in it. Or we're looking around at what everybody else has, making us not even see or value the gifts that we have been given. God's call comes with God's people. But if we don't know where we fit in, we will likely be destroying the church more than we are building it up. When we know where we fit in, then we will appreciate the gifts in other people because then we can be thankful that we don't have to do it all by ourselves because we are not equipped to do it all by ourselves. God has gifted us with an expression of his love to bless the world. He has put something inside of us meant to bless the church for the equipping of the saints and ministry. We have an expression of him, not the totality of him, because then we wouldn't need him or each other. And that's not the way that he set it up. So I prepared uh, an illustration that I wanted to share. Um, and then just reiterating Hebrews 10, 24 through 25, as we're considering uh, one another and, um, and assembling together, not forsaking the assembly of one another. You see, we've all been given a gift and don't always know what it is. And so here's the illustration that I came up with. I think uh, God will give one something like this. And then we're like, okay, cool. I can identify that, but that's all I have. It doesn't really mean much. And then we kind of put it down, but we showed up. And then we see, oh, somebody else got that. Well, they got a wheel, but they got all this other stuff with it. But because they only have one wheel, they can't go too far. And this stuff is actually just weighing them down. And they're going in circles and probably cutting everybody with this. But at least they showed up. And then we have somebody else with a wheel, but they have a whole lot more stuff attached to them very dysfunctional. Nobody even knows what this thing is. And then at least they showed up. They're hurting and they're hurting everybody else. And then this has no idea where to go. This gets all the attention, but you can see it's really just an empty vessel, but everybody is wowed by what's on the outside. And then we have all these pieces. And then I believe that is really what the church is doing. We're just showing up like this. And everybody's saying, what is it? But we're all coming together. And that is not what God has called us to. He has called us to assemble ourselves, to know what we have, and then to value it. So then the one with the wheel, when it realizes, I can't do this by myself, it'll connect with another wheel. And then this piece that has been doing the most damage shows up. And connects. And then we have another wheel. And then I just lost the shell. But you get the idea. And it can come on here. And then it starts taking on a form. And then before you know it, is everybody is identifying what they have been given. And then they're assembling with one another. It becomes easy to identify what it is and the attention, the intention it should have. Because I believe that the church is the vehicle that God wants to use to make his name known. But we can't do it until we know the gift of God inside of us and then start assembling ourselves with the rest of the body of believers, especially as we see the day approaching. The day is approaching. So let us found, be found in unity, stirred by the word of God, and then keeping in step with the Holy Spirit. I am going to close with Hebrews 10, 24 again. 
I say, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as in the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. Let's get into position. Let's get assembled so that we can point people to Jesus Christ. And they won't be confused when they look at us, but they will know what the message is clearly. Thank you so much for stopping by, and I can't wait to see you next time.